Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Bjorn Andre, Jeff Wilkes, and Father Kadan. Coming up on DTNS, will E3 be more like PAX in the future? Plus, Sony pulls movies that people paid for and pulls discs from collectible bundles. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 8th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From deep in Dogtown, St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And we are very happy to have TV host and streamer Trisha Hirschberger back on the show. Hi, everybody. Hi, friends. Let's talk some (laughs) tech. There, we get the applause. Oh, wow. Very fancy. (laughs) Uh, We're going to talk about E3. We're going to talk about Sony. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. In early April, Microsoft began blocking VBA macros on downloaded Office documents by default as a security precaution. A company said it's going to roll back that decision, citing feedback from customers. Microsoft did not initially announce the rollback, but confirmed the change after customers noticed a change in the default behavior. My stuff is broken. SpaceX announced Starlink Maritime, a satellite internet service for watercraft offering up to 350 megabits per second down. Customers need to purchase dual terminals, a fancy set of antennas for $10,000 as a one-time cost with a monthly service at $5,000 a month. Coverage at launch is limited to coastal waters in North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, and Chile. While that surely sounds painfully expensive, SpaceX has a case study that points out that moving to Starlink from traditional very small aperture satellite internet service for their drone ships dropped their monthly internet tab from $165,000 a month to a mere $50,000 a month while increasing uh, what they call fleet throughput by 5,900%. Seriously, uh, from very limited personal experience, uh, traditional high-speed satellites in obscure areas or out on the ocean is insanely, emotionally, traumatizingly, painfully expensive. It's one of those, compared to what you were paying, it sounds cheap. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We like to keep you up to date on fast-growing services you might not hear about anywhere else, but you might hear about down the road. And because you listen here, you already know about them. Universal Music Group signed a deal to make its catalog available to Umdundo, M-D-U-N-D-O. It's the fast-growing music service with about 20 million users as of the end of June, mostly in Nigeria, uh, but also expanding across Kenya, Ghana, and Tanzania. Universal Music Group is behind some of the biggest labels on the continent, so it's a good get for Umdundo. Uh, Def Jam Africa, Blue Note Africa, and Motown Gospel Africa will be joining the platform, among others. Nice. Netflix is sponsored with, excuse me, Netflix has partnered with Sennheiser to replace boring old stereo audio with Sennheiser's Ambio 2 channel spatial audio system, at least on some of its original programming, most notably Stranger Things Season 4. Just search for spatial audio and you'll find a list of Netflix titles that include the feature. Netflix already offered spatial audio on supported Apple products, but this is supposed to run on anything from cheap TV speakers to your cell phone, headphones, tablets, laptops. You get the idea. I've had a good 10, 20 minutes puttering with it, and I can safely report it is ye old psycho acoustically tweak stereo sound to make it more bigger and enveloping uh big props to sennheiser by the way for giving re-recording mixers the ability to tweak this in the production process um i'm looking at you poorly rendered spatial audio and classic albums from certain music sites that make me go why why did you do this to this innocent album so, so what you're saying is what sennheiser doing is very <laughs> spatial <laughs> the wall street journal sources say google has offered to place the part of its business that auctions and places ads into a separate company but still under the alphabet umbrella remember google's part of alphabet as is waymo and a bunch of other companies they just take all the ad tech and make it its own alphabet mm. company right that solves Whatever. the problem right yeah. Uh, The U.S. Department of Justice has been investigating Google for abusing its position as both a broker and auctioneer of the ads. Usually those are separate parts of the process. Uh, There was no information about whether this part of Google's proposal would be acceptable to the DOJ or not. All right. Uh, You laugh, but you never you never know until you ask. Uh, I'm going to be very. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, what's going on with uh, Sony and movies right now. And I'm not talking about Sony Pictures in this case. We're, We're talking about PlayStation. Tell us. Last Matt. year in August, 
Sorry, a bit of a internet lag there. Last year on August 31st, Sony stopped offering TV shows and movies on its PlayStation Store. And at the time, it wrote that users can still access movie and TV content they have purchased through PlayStation Store for on-demand playback on their PS4, PS5, and mobile devices. It's okay. We're just not selling any new stuff. They didn't exactly say for how long, though. And as of August 31st this year, customers in Germany and Austria, at least, will no longer be able to view your previously purchased Studio Canal content. It will be removed from your video library. Uh, Variety reports that's about 314 titles in Germany and 137 in Austria. Uh, most importantly, for a lot of people, that's going to include both Paddington movies and The Children Wept and some Lionsgate films like John Wick and Hunger Games and The Teens and Older People Wept. Uh, we have not heard whether any refunds would be offered. I hope in Sony's case they make good on this because this is just not nice. This is the exception that proves the rule. Most the, Everybody talks about af being afraid that this right. will happen. It almost never happens. Uh, but this is the worst case scenario of I paid for a thing and now I can't use it anymore. Uh, the reason this doesn't usually happen is when companies do close down, like Flickster did, for instance. Uh, Flickster, not Quickster, that was Netflix. Flickster uh, was a was a TV movie rental service, a sales service. They migrated right. you to another service. Uh, Target had its own service. They migrated you to another service and Sony didn't do that. When Sony shut down their thing, they just decided they would keep making it available for people. And you knew that without migrating you to a going concern, they weren't going to be able to afford to continue to do that. My guess here is that there is a deal with Studio Canal that expired and Studio Canal said, well, if you are not continuing to make us money, we're not going to renew that deal. Yeah, yeah, that definitely tracks. Uh, and, you know, like <laughs> you guys were saying, this is the age old argument to buy physical media. Why would you buy physical media? I know a lot of us are digital only. I'm mostly digital only because I have tons of DVDs and Blu-rays that just take up space on my shelf. Now, if you collect those, that is like a niche thing that a lot of people go for. But the argument to collect those, even if that's not your specific specific collector style, is that when something like this happens, you're not SOL so to speak. And I, I feel awful for, you know, those folks in Germany and Austria right now that paid for own, owned these movies, but don't actually own them. It's, it's a good reminder when you buy things on a digital service, what are you actually buying? You need, yeah. you're buying into the service. And if the service is no longer there, then neither are your purchased items. I, I think if you look at music, what we're seeing with music is People have gotten over the fear of not being able to own because so much is available so much of the time. We're not there with video. Uh, we don't feel secure yet that like, well, if I want to watch something, it'll be somewhere, right? Because most stuff is somewhere, <laughs> uh, but it's also not everywhere. Whereas music is is pretty much everywhere, right? You, you can find it. Most things are also on Tidal, Spotify, Apple Music. Whereas in video, it's, well, if it's on Netflix, it's not on Disney+. Plus. It's not on the other thing. So it's more complicated. I don't think it's necessary for everyone to switch to physical media right away. This is just bad policy from Sony, and they should have done better by their customers from the moment they ended this last year. I, I'm just going to quietly ignore the large stack of Blu-rays and CDs that occupy storage in this basement. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's a, I, I, You are absolutely correct, Tom that this is the nightmare scenario that almost never happens uh you know and as trish points out you know most people are living the you know the 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 streaming lifestyle i i, f I also feel like the options have narrowed so much that the players that are remaining uh to buy content online are pretty you know i mean if you look at like apple google um, these are huge companies that that this is practically a side sell for their primary businesses. So I, I think they'll be able to keep this supported. But it's always a little nerve wracking, um, you know, especially if you can't do things like migrate titles to movies anywhere, which you still can't do with a bunch of titles. Including, that, would have been, think, that would have been the other thing, right? If Sony was part of right. movies anywhere, then you would just like open a voodoo account before Sony closed down, port most of your stuff over, although some exceptions, including Lionsgate. Uh, weren't part of yeah. movies anywhere, right? So that's another. Part I was of this. about to point that out. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's so close, so close. So, mm -hmm. yes, I was going to ask: Is movies anywhere kind of generally regarded as the most ubiquitous of the movie streaming services at this point? Well, it's it's 
it's the only cross service platform, right. right? So if 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 you're going to if you're going to participate in in buying movies online, which again, I think a lot of fewer people are doing that than they used to because they just decide to stream stuff off of whatever service they happen to be right. using rather than owning them. Uh, but but yeah, movies anywhere is the way to go. It's kind of your only thing. Uh, there was another one called Ultraviolet that went away. So you're you're pretty much yeah. you know your category management is movies anywhere. They just need to get everyone in in the in the store, so to speak. <laughs> uh, well. Similar story here, but with a different spin. God of War Ragnarok, now scheduled for release on November 9th for PS4 and PS5. And as with most big game releases these days, there are special collector's editions that feature all kinds of cool extras in there. Uh, for instance, the Jotnar edition includes a Mjolnir replica, you know, Thor's hammer, uh, a Knowledge Keeper's shrine that looks really cool, a 7-inch vinyl record that has the music Ooh. from the game by Bear McCrary. You get pins, you get rings, there's a steelbook display display case, bunch more stuff. It does not, however, <laughs> include the game disc. <laughs> Neither version of the collector's edition. Uh, they have two. There's Jotnar and just the collector's edition. Neither of them include the game disc. You get a digital download code. So you get the game, but it's a code, a code that you cannot use until the box with the code in it physically arrives in your hands. So you're not going to be preloading. You can still buy a disc of Thor Ragnarok uh, or, or God of War Ragnarok if you want, but that is separate. That's the standard of the launch editions of the game. The launch edition comes with some free DLC, but these don't include any of the physical objects that the collector's edition do. Now, Sony's done this before. They previously omitted the disc in the collector's edition of Horizon Forbidden West, but they did sell a special edition with a steel book and a mini art book. Uh, Mass Effect Legendary Edition also offered a legendary cash bundle that didn't even include a copy of the game at all, physical or digital. Uh, but there were other versions of with collectibles that did. It's no secret that growing number of gamers don't buy discs. Uh, Ars Technica notes that in its retail spot check, uh, they estimate about 25% of the people who bought a PS5 opted for the one without a Blu-ray drive. So offering collector's editions with a download code isn't odd. Ubisoft has done that a lot. But not offering an option that has a disc kind of seems like it might be an emerging trend. Trisha, is this just the way of things? I mean, honestly, since the latest gen console releases, both PlayStation and Xbox have offered a digital only option. I wonder if this is a way to not make the folks who've purchased the digital only console feel excluded. Like this way they can still hmm. get the premium collector's edition without, you know, a disc that feels like, oh, maybe I should have a different console. I don't know. That was my only thought in reading this. I think it's very funny to get a steel case. Without without a disc, yeah. Without a disc, that seems strange. But that being said, I purchased the Horizon Forbidden West Special Edition. I have the steel case, and I just used the download code. And when I got it, it didn't strike me as weird at that time. Now, when we're talking about it here, I'm like, oh yeah, that is strange. But it made me think: what about when I got Horizon Forbidden West Special Edition? Didn't feel weird then. I guess I guess we're all just so used to digital game codes mm -hmm. at this point, or especially if you come from PC gaming, you're very used to Steam codes. I don't know, Patrick. What are your yeah. thoughts? Um, no, we, we well, there's like no console gaming. The closest thing we have to a console in the house is a play date. Um, so you know, part of me was like, that's right. People still get games on. You know, Captain, I have 300 Blu-rays. Is like, oh yes. Video games are still sold on discs. Isn't that fascinating? How quaint. Um, but the, because uh, everything in our house all came off of, you know, Steam or, or one of the other platforms. Um, yeah, I, I'm with, uh, part of me was like, so Tom and I were talking about this earlier. Part of me is like, this is, eh. And then part of me was like, it is really weird. I think you nailed it on the head. The whole point of a steel case is to have a disc inside of it. And to have a steel case without a disc is just peculiar. Um, you know, I'm also wondering when there's going to be the first sort of special edition cassette to go along with the seven inch vinyl option since I've, I've, oh, I've, yeah, been, that's coming. I've been, oh yeah, it's coming because I've been seeing more and more people yeah. releasing cassette versions, mm -hmm, you know, and mm -hmm. 
And I've, I've even found a place that claims to be doing eight tracks, new eight tracks. And I'm trying to figure out where they're sourcing those because I thought nobody in the world was still making them. So just when you thought you were done with lots of dead mediums, they come <laughs> crawling back. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not weird to me that they would offer a collector's edition with a download code. Uh, right. There's there's a bunch of music acts that I follow that do that when they put their concert stuff out on Blu-ray. They'll offer you right. uh, a version that's just the download code, uh, but you still get all the books and pictures and stuff and liner notes that go along with it. So uh, I get that. What I don't get is not offering you the version with the disc, right? Why why not also have one for the person who either uses the discs to play? Or even just wants to have the disc as an artifact, right? As as a thing to to have in their collection. Some people are like that. They just they just want to have the physical thing. Yeah, I mean, is this a move by Sony to like them kind of communicating to us that they think that the physical media is on its way out? I don't know. <laughs> I I We're wonder so tired if tired of having a permanent copy of this. So well, tired. I, I wonder if it's that <laughs> or if they just don't want to pay to do the production yeah. run you know it, obviously they're they're making discs because they're selling the standard edition but they don't have to make as many i don't know yeah it's 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 just peculiar maybe nobody maybe somebody forgot maybe it got through all the layers of people who have to sign up on this oh, wait. and somebody somebody from sony america is going to be like oh crap wasn't we forgot that skew. To be one with the CD <laughs> in the steel case. Wasn't that supposed to happen? Well, now they've forgot for three franchise special editions in a row. You know. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, uh, that's or maybe like a statement. Maybe you could. <laughs> well, I mean, you can buy it as an add-on, right? You can buy the standard edition, take the CD, and put it in your steel case. I suppose. <laughs> to just, go with your codes, so it's you just a little extra it. money. Yeah. Um, and, and so you didn't worry about preload lights. when you've gotten the digital code shipped to you before, Trisha. It sounds like that wasn't a big deal. No, I, I you know, I, I try to plan it for the day that I'm going to stream the game or something like that when I have access to it. And generally, I will either wake up really early in the morning because I'm excited and just, you know, get it mm. that morning. So before my stream starts, I know I have plenty of time to download it. Um, preload is always nice, but for me, it's not a necessity. Not a big deal. Uh, well, folks, uh, hopefully these are of interest to you. That's why we talk about this stuff. But uh, we're always interested in what you would like to hear us talk about on the show. In fact, a couple of these stories today and the quick ones at the top came from our subreddit. So get in there and uh, submit stuff and vote at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. The Entertainment Software Association, which puts on E3, when E3 happens, uh, announced Thursday that E3 will happen in the second week of June next year in person and online from the Los Angeles Convention Center as is supposed to happen in the world. All will be back to normal. The ESA also said it will, quote, feature in-person consumer components, which is what ReadPop is kind of famous for. And I bring that up because ESA is partnering with ReadPop, which puts on PAX, New York Comic Con, Star Wars Celebration, among other things. ReadPop also runs gaming websites like Eurogamer, Rock Paper Shotgun, and GamesIndustry.biz. Uh, E3 has been so many things to us over the years from a small thing in a hotel one year suddenly uh, to you know the largest video game show in the world at times. Do we think that ReadPop can help them reach their final form? Is this the end game for E3? Can you think of any other horrible gaming metaphors for this, Trish? <laughs> uh, it's a third, yeah, third form on the boss battle. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm failing on your gaming metaphors, but I honestly really do hope that ReadPop can build E3 into something special again, whether it's just nostalgia or, you know, my, my fan fervor. Um, E3 is something that holds a special place in my heart. And I think that, you know, it's very possible that the time of E3 as it once was has now gone by now that we see a lot of virtual keynotes at events like this. But there is something still very special about a PAX, about a Star Wars celebration. That's all of these gaming fans and enthusiasts gathering together to celebrate their love of video games. And so if ESA is trying to transform E3 from an industry only event to a fan event or an industry and fan event hybrid, as we've seen it in some past years. I, I have hope that ReadPop could do it. I mean, PAX is probably one of the best 
enthusiast events as far as catering to the consumers and not just the industry that I've ever been to. Again, Star Wars celebrations very like that as well as New York Comic Con. Um, so fingers crossed that that could happen. Um, I, you know, as someone that has worked in games journalism over the years and has gone simply just to cosplay and be a fan of video games, I would love to see an in-person event come back and be really special. Now, if it is going to be all digital keynotes from here on out and that that fan component, that uh, even even hands on component, if that's missing, I do think E3 might be dead in the water. What do you what do you think, Patrick? I, you know, it's it's funny because I, I read this, then I read this again, and then all I could think of was there were two gentlemen. I I, I had to fly recently, um, and I routed through I don't know Phoenix or Vegas, but a couple of guys got on the plane were on their way home from uh, Star Wars Celebration, and you know these are you know two guys in their thirties, and they spent like the first twenty five minutes of the flight telling the the basically the grandma sitting in between them about this convention and you know when you talk to people about star wars celebration or you talk to people about pax you know it's just a giant fire hose of stoke people love it it's amazing it's this incredible experience it taps into all this stuff that they love to do it's inclusive it goes on and on and on and on so if anybody can make a you know e3 this extraordinary experience i would think read pop is uh either that or read pop has just managed to associate itself with extraordinary events that it just happens you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it's if if the problem is the management and not the event, then I feel like E three's got a really good shot with Reed Pop, because um, the stuff they put on is just beloved. Yeah, they've got an amazing track record, and yeah. I, I could see someone somewhere saying, "Well, imagine if Pax had the industry built into it already. Not that Pax doesn't have the industry, right? But they've had to go bring right. the industry to it. E three already has the industry there." Uh, it's go. It's going to still show up, even even with all of the uncertainties over the past few years with COVID and everything. The industry is going to show up at E3. So if Reed Pop can plug that into the consumer base, I mean, I can imagine a scenario where virtual keynotes still happen, but you can experience them at E3 in the hall and get hands on with the games, even if the presentation isn't actually in the hall, and right. people still be pretty happy with that. Yeah, I think I think that would be the hybrid way to do it moving forward. And then, of course, now we also have EA's Summer of Play and mm -hmm. Summer Games Fest and all of these other E3 like events taking place at the same time, vying for that E3 type mantle, if you will. Who's going to be the next E3? Um, and so I think it's it's a little sad for ESA that they're vying for their own title of who's going to be the next E3. But <laughs> it, I just I as a fan and as someone who, uh, you know, does work in gaming journalism from time to time, I'm just sitting back with my popcorn anxiously awaiting what comes. Next. Your read popcorn. My read popcorn. Oh! <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. Tokyo Game Show is not a bad model for, you know, that kind of hybrid event. So it, it can certainly be done. I, uh, I I look forward to seeing what what they come up with. I don't know. Maybe they'll partner with Keeley or something crazy like that. I'm not, you know, you never know. There's, uh, thinking outside of the box yet to be done. <laughs> Uh, speaking of thinking outside the box, right now, solar energy is about 3% of the global supply. And when a solar panel goes dead, it pretty much becomes trash. Uh, it can be sold as crushed glass or, or something like that, but it's not really effectively recycled. You might want to hold on to those dead solar panels then, because Norwegian energy industry <laughs> analyst Reichstad believes the, econom the economics of recycling solar panels is about to change. It estimates the value of recyclable materials from solar panels may grow from the $170 million it is now. It's not nothing, but it's not a lot, considering the number of panels, to $2.7 by 2030. And there's three reasons for that expectation. One, solar panels are becoming more affordable to install, and therefore more people are installing them, which is raising the demand for new panels. Two, the materials to make those new panels are becoming more in demand because they're making more panels, and the handful of countries that mine and process the materials needed are coming under closer scrutiny and sometimes outright sanctions, as in the case of some solar products made in China. So there are there's a tightening of supply of the materials not not the least of which is logistics and supply chain issues that are affecting everything and three 
It's becoming easier and cheaper to extract valuable materials from older panels. Used to be you couldn't really get the silver and polysilicon out. They're making progress on being able to do that as well as many of the other materials in there. So it looks like we may be able to take those old solar panels that have like a 25-year lifespan, which right now that means some of the earliest installations from the early 2000s are reaching the end of their life and possibly extract the materials to create new solar panels out of them. I like this. Um, you know, it's been kind of crazy watching the recycling. I, a, a few years ago, I fix it. Uh, Kyle kind of started tracing some devices, kind of from turning them in for e-cycling to where they ended up. And, you know, the, the terrifying thing is, okay, some stuff ended up in landfills, despite the fact it was supposed to be recycled. Some stuff ends up, you know, in streets, in open flames, basically being melted down for whatever metals they can get off of the board. The rest of it kind of gets pitched. And it's kind of extraordinary to watch, uh, especially as the availability on some of these rare earths gets squirrelier and squirrelier or more complicated or more expensive, or just the fact that we're running out. Um, hopefully, this continues to grow as an option because otherwise you get into that science fiction trope where you're mining landfills in your urban dystopia, you know, searching for <laughs> capacitors or, you know, bits and pieces. Kind of Wall-E situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, not to get too uh, sci-fi dystopia dramatic, but uh, I love anything that keeps stuff out of landfills is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah. yeah, Pat, when you were reading that, did you happen to read if there were certain e-cycling services that, you know, had a better track record than others? There are. Uh, you know, I found out that in a lot of cases, it's just gotten so much better in the last few years. And there's a sort of a, a uh, best thing to do, I could say, is kind of go to iFixit and see where they recommend. But most of the major places you can recycle stuff now, I, I feel comfortable in saying that most of the major places you can recycle stuff now are much better about it. But uh, I do not have the latest information on, on who the best places to take stuff to is. Gotcha. So. Well, cool. I will do some research. Uh, and if you know some places, you can email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let's check the mailbag now. Jeff wrote in uh, and pointed out that on yesterday's show, DTNS 4311, uh, Patrick and myself contemplated the value of a meta account versus a Facebook account in relation to Quest headsets. Uh, the news was that they're dropping the requirement of a Facebook account and implementing meta accounts in August. Uh, and I was pointing out that there's not a lot of difference between those two because Facebook's, you know, still owned by meta and meta still owns all your data either way. Uh, Jeff writes, a lot of people are contemplating whether there's a difference, but for me, there's an important difference. When my son received a Quest 2 headset, I had to use my Facebook account to set it up, so he was immediately linked with my social graph, which doesn't include anyone less than three times his age. It also linked the friends he games with, all of whom are less than a third my age, to my Facebook account. Having a separate meta account means that I can finally separate him and his gaming social graph from my Facebook social graph by creating his own account. It also means that I can now consider getting a second headset so that we can game together since previously doing so would have involved me creating another Facebook account, which not only would have violated their terms of use, but been a heavy hammered approach to the small issue of wanting to game with my son. Hmm. That is such a good point. That is such a good use case example, because I do think a lot of us are talking about it of who owns all your data. But when it comes to the practical everyday applications of using these devices, that's a, a really solid use case. Yeah, I don't, when my son's old enough to use a VR headset, I don't want all of his little gaming friends attached to my Facebook. <laughs> right? <laughs> but they'll be charming. <laughs> Well, and, and this is a lot of Crickets. times when people say, like, why do you need an account for children? Uh, you know, and, and the, the answer is maybe you don't need a Facebook account for children, but you right. might want to play games with your children on the Quest, in which case and, you need an account for them to play because that's the way they set up the Quest, unfortunately. And to be yeah. fair, when we say for children, the Quest is recommended for ages 13 and up. So not little, little children. Right. Uh, but for teenagers, yeah, and you might not want them to have their own Facebook account yet. Also, I think from a marketing standpoint, there are people who think, oh, I don't want a Facebook account. I left Facebook ages ago. But Meta, is this a new thing? You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, we touched on that yesterday. We might have uh, just sort of assumed it more than, than talked about it. But that's the part of it where I'm like, 
it really is just a brand change in that respect. And and that probably will help Meta because some people who are anti-Facebook will be, a, oh, oh, I'll, I'll sign up. It's not called Facebook now and not look too much farther into it, um, which, you know, good good for them, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of people who are pro Instagram, but anti Facebook. So, Oh, sure. I, I am one of them. I'm not anti Facebook, but I don't use Facebook. I don't like using Facebook and I, I rarely log into it, but I use Instagram all the time because I don't have a moral objection to the company. I just, I just like one product over the other, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> what experience. Uh, well, let's uh, thank Patrick Norton for being with us for two days in a row. Thank you, Patrick, for, for stepping in. It was great to have you, man. Thanks for having me. It was uh, great to be here. Uh, as always, tweet at Patrick Norton or uh, head over to AVXL or search for AVXL and your favorite podcatcher to hear Robert and I. And by the way, how to recycle end of life electronics, uh, ifixit.com slash wiki slash e dash waste is a place to go to find out where to oh, nice. get rid of your stuff in a certified and uh, smart manner. So hopefully that helps everybody out. And uh, there's a link in the show notes for you, Trish. <laughs> Yay. Trisha Hirschberger, thank you so much for bringing your sunshine into the show. As always, it's a mm-hmm. pleasure to have you back. Where can folks find out what you've got going on online? Thank you so much for having me, Tom. This is always so fun. If people want to follow what I'm up to online, um, I stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Trisha Hirschberger, or you can follow me on all the socials at that girl Trish with no I in the girl. So that GRL Trish. Um, and I, I do the tech and gamey hosty things for a variety of different outlets. Uh, so if you watch Amazon Live, if you watch Twitch Gaming, if you watch IGN, if you watch Crown Channel, you'll see my face pop up in those places from time to time. But yeah, my home base at that girl Trish or twitch.tv slash Trisha Hirschberger. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And uh, thanks to our brand new boss uh, who who made the show possible. We couldn't have had Trish or Patrick here without the help of our patrons, including the newest patron, Johnny Homecoming. Thank you, Johnny, for Yay. supporting the show yesterday. And, uh, you know, if we get a brand new boss, we give him a big old shout out on the show. Could be you tomorrow. Patreon.com slash DTNS. There's also a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet that starts right now for patrons available at patreon.com slash DTNS. We're live 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back Monday with Nika Monford from Snob OS as our guest. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods! Beatmaster, W's got us one. BioCow, Captain Kipper, Gadget Virtuoso, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luders, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributions for this week's show came from Shannon Morse, Scott Johnson, and Patrick Norton. And our guest on this week's show was Trisha Hirschberger. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>